This morning's scripture reading comes from Psalms, chapter 100, verses 4 through 5. Psalms 100, 4 through 5, and I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courtyards with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness is to all generations. Amen. We ask the word to bless, we ask the Lord to bless his his word, and Brother DeMag as he brings us the message this morning. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Great to be back here again. Yeah. It's a beautiful church. I loved it. I love coming here. Right. Let's start with a word of prayer if we could. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come here today not just to be with friends, to talk over what's going on through the week, how you have blessed us, but we're here, Father, to worship you. Amen. You have given us one day a week, one day, that's all you ask, to set aside everything that we do, everything that we've been doing throughout the whole week, Lord. A day to do something different, just to rest in you, to meditate on you, and to do good to others. We thank you for that, Father. It's a rest that we so badly need. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will enter into everyone in this room today, and that your word will change the hearts and minds of all of us. We thank you, and we give you all the glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to be uh, in First Thessalonians, if you want to turn there. The message today is thanksgiving or giving thanks. Amen. And who knows what the will of God is for their life? There's probably as many different answers as there are people in this room, probably, you know. Uh, Romans 12, 2 tells us that we're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. We're in this world, but we don't have to act like this world. We stand out from the world, because the world's watching us. They're seeing how we act. And if we're not acting like Christians, you know what they're going to say, right? <coughs> Hypocrites. And that word has kept more people out of the church than we can imagine. They, they follow what we do instead of what God does. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, there's three verses there. In everything, give thanks, for this is a will of God in Christ Jesus concerning who? Us. us. That's his will for us. In everything, give thanks. And verse 16 tells us not only to give thanks, but to what? Rejoice evermore. Now, you know, we can't give thanks for everything like verse 18 says, and we can't rejoice forevermore like verse 16 says if we're not doing what verse 17 says. Pray without ceasing. Prayer is at the top of the list. Sometimes we can't change people by what we tell them, by what we teach them, but if we pray for them, it's the Holy Spirit that's going to change them anyway. You know, we can just inform them. We can teach them. What God says. Praying is nothing more than talking to our maker. You know, either audibly or in our mind. It's a simple dialogue with God. And I say dialogue because a lot of us have a monologue, don't we? Sometimes we get up early in the morning, got to rush off to work, and we say a quick prayer. Or we say a quick prayer before our feet hit the floor. And we go to bed at night. We're laying in bed, and we say, we're starting to pray to God. And, you know, when I go to bed at night, I always read, no matter what. I don't care what time it is. I have to read something. It's just a habit I get into. And I'm reading, and, and you know, I'm reading the Bible or something, and, and I start praying, and next thing I know, I wake up. You know, probably not too much longer, but 
and I feel bad about it. So I finish my prayer before I fall asleep again. But that's not the way it should be, right? We should, we should set aside time for God. I mean, how special are you as ordinary human beings to have a God of the universe at your disposal 24-7? Now, I'm not saying that in a derogatory way, you know, like he works for you. I am saying that we have a God that loves us so much that we can call on him 24-7, day or night. That's how much he loves you. We need to make this personal because it's the most personal, loving relationship that any of us are ever going to have. We may be here as families, but we're here by ourselves, you know. You want your child to grow up knowing God, but ultimately it's going to be up to him. We all have that same chance. Everybody has that same chance. Now, what's the chance of everybody you know leaving you in your lifetime, one way or the other? 100% chance. What's the chance of Jesus Christ staying with you all throughout your lifetime? Yeah. And if we want him to, if we want him to, even throughout eternity, 100% chance. That's a no-brainer, isn't it? Because I think we all are figuring out that this life doesn't last forever, right? He wants to be our friend, our best friend. Have you ever told somebody, a friend that was going through some hard times, maybe a loved one died or they're going through something very uh, traumatic, that give me a call, day or night, 24 sevens? I'm sure you have, right? And then give them your phone number. They might already have it, but give it to them so they can put it on a counter when they need it. Preferably on the back of a church business card. You have those here? You have the cards? With the address, a picture of the church, no? We have them at our church, and many years ago, you know, on the front, it showed the picture of the church, and then the address, and the times, and on the back, it, it showed a map. But they had it so detailed, it was so small, you couldn't really see it. So I kind of redid it. So you get off exit 89, the only interstate, take a left, go up two miles on the right. There we are. Made it simple. And then I had three lines. I could put my name, my phone number, and if I want to add something to it. And I give it out whenever, you know, at work to whoever. It doesn't matter. You know, it's a good, it's a mini evangelism tool. Yeah. I encourage you to get some. Put them right out there and, ha and have a couple in your, on your person to give them out. You see, the people that don't know you very well are going to know why now you act peculiar. Why, why you act different than everybody else that they know. They're going to see that card, that church, and they're going to wonder. That's why God said in 2 Peter, you know, he calls us to be peculiar. To show forth God's praises by the way that we live. And they will want that. And now they will have the means to know where they can get that. Laconia Seventh-day Adventist Church. Give it to them. That spreads God's word. That's another one of his wills for us. Thanking God. I mean, how important is it to do the will of God? The Apostle John said in his first epistle, chapter 2, verse 17, he tells us that the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth how long? Forever. Amen. And who can forget the words of Jesus? In the Garden of Gethsemane, in the book of Mark. Turn there with me if you have your Bible. Mark chapter 14. I'd like to read some verses here, starting off in verse 32. It tells a story of Jesus in his most dire moment, when he needed people around him, when he needed his friends. And they came to a place which is named Gethsemane. And he saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John. And he began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And he saith unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. 
He went to the group of people. He picked out his apostles, and he went a little further. And then he told them to stay there, and then he went a little further. And he went forward a little, and he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but will the I will. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping. And he saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst thou not watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. For the spirit is truly ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away, and he prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither was they what an answer to him. He went back to pray a third time. And he cometh the third time, and he saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Jesus came to his Father three times with that same prayer. Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Jesus was asking his Father to take away the cross. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Abba is Aramaic. Jesus spoke or understood at least three languages. Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek. The Aramaic was a common language in the first century. When Jesus said Abba, it showed his very personal, his very loving relationship to his father. Jesus was letting his father off the hook. He didn't want his father to feel terrible about what he had to do. Give his only son up so you and I could live. Jesus was facing the worst torture known to man at that time. And he still thought of his friends. Sleep on. Take your rest. Psalms 107, the psalmist tells us to give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endureth forever. Thank God for that. God's creation has invented the day. One day a year to be thankful. Thanksgiving. It was a couple days ago, right? Did you all have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah. Yeah. I'm down here at my sister Kathy's right there. Uh, We had a nice Thanksgiving. We don't see him too often, so it's great to get together with family, right? Usually they have the same old routine. You know, it always focuses around food, doesn't it? We eat a bunch of food, maybe go in the living room, sit down, lay on the couch, unbutton our pants and watch football or something. I don't know. Whatever people do. And uh, I have some statistics on Thanksgiving from last year. Do you know Americans spent $1.1 billion on turkeys last year? Ate 535 million pounds of turkey. I didn't think there's that many turkeys in America. Hmm. Spent, they bought 80 million pounds of cranberries. I can't imagine what that would look like. Not to mention everything that goes with it, you know, your bread, squash, potatoes. Don't forget them desserts. I know you Adventists don't really eat desserts, right? That's a staggering number. But there's another staggering number, 305 million pounds. That's the amount of food that Americans threw out that day. You know, scraping off the plate. The little eyes bigger than the belly. Yeah. Some of us here may not have family to go to on Thanksgiving or any other holiday to spend time with. And that can bring anxiety, right? It can set in. But our Father knows us. That's why he gave us this instruction booklet on life. Anything you and I will ever go through is happening here, and he has the answer for it to give us peace. And I don't know about you, but we're living in a time where I need to be peaceful. Turn with me to Philippians, if you will, chapter 4. Philippians 4, verse 6. When you got it, say amen. 
Amen. There. Be careful for nothing. Some Bibles say, do not be anxious for anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds to Christ Jesus. That's where we've got to have the peace. I mean, we can pretend we're, we're, we have peace, but until we get it into our heart, we're not going to have peace. Until we get the Holy Spirit into our heart, we're not going to have Jesus. We can play Christian. We can act it, you know, one day a week. But until it gets inside of us, we're, we're going to have a, a conflict within ourselves. We're going to wonder why we're kind of, yeah, you know, blah. Don't get anxious about anything. I need to put a caveat in there. We can only do that when we've been practicing this verse in our lives. Practice with the little things that usually upset you. Don't let them upset you. And when the big things come, you'll be able to handle it. Otherwise, anxiety will set in. The littlest things will get you worried, worked up, and nervous. But isn't the Bible full of men and women who, of no fault of their own, had their whole lives turned upside down? Yeah. And they're just like you and me. They just lived a long time ago. They were human beings, men and women. I think of Joseph. You know, his own brothers threw him in a pit and then sold him. You know, you think your family has problems. How about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? You know, told to bow down just like everybody else. Be just like everybody else. Conform. Worship a man. What kind of love did they have for their creator? Huh? No compromise. God said, don't do it. Don't do it. If we're not standing firm on the word of God today, when the time comes when the heathens tell us to kneel, we will kneel. It's an undisputable fact. No compromise. We can rationalize all we want because we're human beings. We're good at that, right? Yeah. But we will kneel to the statue of our parents if they don't know God. We will kneel to the statue of our spouse, children, siblings, friends, and even strangers. Like the person who's in charge of us at work, our boss. It's called compromise. The ironic thing about it is if those three boys would have knelt down to stay out of man's fire, they would have ended up in God's fire. Which fire is hotter? Yeah. We're all going to go someday. It's how we go that's important. You want people to say, that was a godly man. That was a godly woman. Yeah. That's the best compliment you can have. Not that how much money he had, how much... How much business is that she had or, you know? It's your character. That's the only thing that we're going to take with us when we go. What people think about us. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, their original names where they were changed, had the best jobs for the king. You know, they worked in the provinces. They wore the best clothes, ate the best food, had a nice house living, had money in their pockets. And if they would have bowed down, they could have even excelled more in that kingdom, right, with the king. Daniel 3.16, they said something special to the king. You remember that? We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. You remember that? Yeah. Everybody remembers that. What do they mean by we are not careful? Who said? Oh, yeah, that's right. We don't have to think about it, right? We know. And what was this matter that they were talking about? matter who they worship yeah they knew god's words so much that when somebody asked you to do something no nah, not gonna do it can't do it yeah. i had a job uh my last job before this one i was going to church on sunday every sunday 
We were devout. Read the Bible every day, and, and they found out about the seventh day. Somebody gave us a little track. That's all it took. Studied it out. Ended up going to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So I told my boss, who half of the year we would have to work Saturday if it snowed. And I went to him and I said, you know, I don't go to church on Sunday anymore. I'm a Sabbath keeper and I can't work on Saturday. And if you want to, you know, let me go, I understand. He said, no. You know, he'll talk to the higher-ups. And fortunately, they like me. They like my work. So I kept on working for him. And throughout the winter, when it snowed on Saturday, the other crew would have to work a little bit harder, and my boss would jump in. You know? But I couldn't work on Saturday. And if they would have fired me, I didn't want to be fired, but I would have had to look for another job. No compromise. You see, they knew God, but more importantly, they knew God's word. The first commandment of God. You know? I am the Lord thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I shall have no other gods before me. They knew that and they lived that. Verse 17 says, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Did you hear that? If you're going to do it, our God's able. You notice something there? They didn't say he would. They said he's able. They're saying he might not. We may burn to death, but we don't care. We're not going to compromise. And some of us today are compromising for our work, for a man that doesn't even know us. And if we had died yesterday, we'd be replaced in two weeks, and they wouldn't even remember our name. You know what our pastor told us? He was telling us uh, about a month ago that uh, a friend of his works for this company, you know, and they sell stuff online or whatever, and, you know, and somebody died, you know, one of the workers, and they sent out an email to the people that work there, and they said, you know, so-and-so passed on, but we don't want that to affect, you know, the way you work. We want you to keep on working hard, you know, keep on selling. That's what they said. That's all he said. Can you imagine? Now you'd think that they'd lose a lot of people after that. Hmm. That's hard to believe. I think the rest of the verse is what gave them hope, what gave them courage. He said, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. That's the main thing. Get away from Satan. Whether... You know, we live or we die, we we're going to be away from Satan. Whatever happened, he would save them from that lifestyle. You see, they knew one thing that most people don't seem to know today. And that that's everybody dies, but not everybody goes to heaven. A lot of people think everybody goes to heaven, but they're not reading this book. That's the story of a young person. If you turn to Daniel, we're going to find the story of an older person, 80-year-old man in Daniel 4. In Daniel 4, we read about the life story of a man, a man named Daniel, who nothing was ever said bad about him in the Bible. That's a man with character. King Nebuchadnezzar, he has this dream. Remember that? And he brings in all his astrologers and his soothsayers and Chaldeans, and you know he asks them to interpret the dream, but they can't. So he brings in Daniel, and, and Daniel interprets it. And what it boils down to was the king was going against God's word, and Daniel told him, you know, that lifestyle, building statues, wanting people to bow down, it's going to be the end of you. You're going to turn into a beast and be in a field for seven years. So he was good for a while. But when he saw nothing bad happen, he went back to that old lifestyle. Verse 30, he said, he built Babylon by his power, by his might, by his majesty. He couldn't even finish that sentence before he heard the voice of God. Your kingdom, your lifestyle, your way of living is done. 
I'm paraphrasing. I gave you a warning. You did not heed it. God always warns us. And he became a beast in the field for seven years. You see, friends, when we lift ourselves up, when we have that wrong kind of pride, it's okay to have pride. I mean, if you're an artist or you're a carpenter and you build things and you have friends come over, you want to show them what you did, right? That's okay. I mean, I think it's in all of us. But when we boast about ourselves, right, when we brag, I work with a guy that he just thinks he's a cat's meow about certain things. And if you bring up that subject, he better, you know, have a lunch with you because he's going to tell you everything he can do and how good he can do it and how long he's been doing it. Because I hear him tell that to, you know, just about everybody that comes into the building. When we lose our humility to serve others, God will have to act. Like Nebuchadnezzar, we've been warned. You know, some of us Christians have been going against God's will for our lives that uh, since God hasn't punished us yet, we think he's okay with it. But yet is the operative word. It may not happen in this lifetime. But when the time comes, many people are going to find out when we take that great sleep that we're going to oversleep for about a thousand years. After Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar took over the kingdom. He had a party one day. Thousands of his friends come over. He had his wives and his concubines, and he was getting uh, a little bit tipsy on that fermented grape juice. That's what that'll do, won't it? Alcohol make you say and do things you never would say or do or think. So he decides to send to get the cups, the vessels that Nebuchadnezzar stole from the church in Jerusalem years before, gold and silver. He's going to really show them, you know, how high he's gone. And so they're drinking out of those cups, and then he looks over, and he sees the writing of a man's hand on the wall. And his knees start to shake. He gets so scared. So he calls on the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, the astrologers, and he asks them to interpret the writing on the wall, and they said they can't. And he gets real scared now. So then the queen steps up and says, O king, there's a man in your kingdom named Daniel, who Nebuchadnezzar called Belteshazzar. He can interpret the writing on the wall. So they called on Daniel. He said, Daniel, if you can interpret that writing, I will clothe you in scarlet, put a gold chain about your neck, and make you third ruler of the kingdom. Daniel looked at it, and he said, O king, I can interpret the writing, but as for your gifts, give them to someone else. He looked, meany, meany, to kill you, fearsome. Meany, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. To kill, thou are weighed in the balances and been found wanting. You fearsome. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That very night, the king died. He was slain. He gave Daniel the robe, the chain. He made him third ruler of the kingdom. Darius the Mede took over. He did it right. He had a thousand princes that he put out all through his kingdom. And they would, I don't know, maybe collect taxes, but they were like sheriffs or whatever. If, if two people had a dispute, two neighbors, they could go to the prince and he would, you know, solve it. And if they couldn't solve it, they'd go to the three presidents, of which Daniel was the head president. And if they couldn't solve it, then they'd go to the king. It left the, you know, the king open to do important business. But they didn't like Daniel because you know, he was a slave. He didn't, he didn't worship their God. So they were prideful, so they wanted to get rid of him. So they all got together, and they said, uh, how are we going to get rid of Daniel? And somebody spoke up and said, well, as for the kingdom, we cannot get rid of Daniel. They knew that he was a man who knew his job. He was good at it. He cared about people. He didn't steal, right? But that's the way sin is. They still wanted to get rid of him. Reminds me of Isaiah 5.20, where it says, Woe unto the people who call evil good and good evil, and evil good and good evil, right? That's happening today, isn't it? Who put darkness for light and light for darkness, 
who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Everybody today seems like thinks they're wise in their own eyes and they're calling good evil. See, they didn't care if he was doing good. They called it evil because they had pride in their hearts and they just couldn't shake it. And that's what pride will do. That's what started this whole sin business in the beginning. Lucifer. So they said, well, the only way you're going to get rid of Daniel is by his God. They knew he prayed three times a day. So they went to the king and, you know, paraphrased, and he said, oh, king, hey, wouldn't it be great if just for 30 days everybody went to you and prayed, prayed to you? And if they prayed to anybody else, you know, they get thrown in the den of lions. Now, Darius, he must have thought that was a good idea because the verse that says they, they talked to him about it, and when he said, okay, there's no verses in between. They appeal to his pride. He can be a god for 30 days. That's what it boils down to. Right? So they did it. Danny went home that day. And I can, you know, I can just see him walking into his house and getting ready to kneel down in front of that open window. And he sees some of his princes over there, maybe some of the presidents, watching behind a corner. Kneels down and prays. And he knew about the decree. He knew it. No compromise. So they went and told the king. And the king was distraught. He liked Daniel. He knew he was tricked. So they took him to the lion's den. My mind is maybe like a pit in the ground or something, you know. And, and as they lowered him in, the king says, O Daniel, that God whom thou serve continuously is able to save thee from the mouths of the lions. I think he said that to maybe help Daniel, but to pacify his conscience a little bit, you know. So he goes back to the castle there, and he can't eat, he can't drink, he can't sleep. He doesn't want to hear any music. Next morning it says, you know, he hurried there. And kings don't hurry, do they? No, no, no. He hurried there. So the stone back, and he hollers down in, Oh, Daniel, is thy God whom thy serve continuously able to save thee from the mouths of the lions? And you hear Daniel. O king, my God whom I serve continuously has shut the, sent an angel and shut the lion's mouth. Praise God. See, God gave Nebuchadnezzar a kingdom and he took it back because he was proud. Belshazzar lost his kingdom because he had no humility. Two things that will bring us down. And cost us eternal life. Daniel's lifestyle, his commitment, his courage to God, made a pagan king say these words. Turn over a couple pages in your Bible. Chapter 6 of Daniel. A pagan king said these words. 625. You know, Nebuchadnezzar said those just about the same words uh, earlier with uh, the three worthies. Then King Darius wrote unto all the people, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is a living God, and steadfast forever. And his kingdom that shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth. And he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. You know, friends, we don't know how many lions were in that den that day. In my mind, I know that they were hungry, mean, and ready to kill anything that was lowered into that pit. The guards knew how many lions were in that pit. The king knew how many lions were down in that den. But that day, they didn't know that there was one more lion in that den. You know, I can see it in my own mind. <laughs> might be different than yours, but uh, as they lowered Daniel down in, Daniel looked down and he saw the back of a massive lion with a mane that just went from its head down to its neck. 
As he got closer, I can just see that lion turning and looking up at Daniel with these penetrating eyes. And then turns back around to face all the rest of the lions. Daniel was saved that day, my friends, because he had faith. Daniel was saved that day because he had courage. Daniel was saved that day because he had commitment. And most of all, Daniel was saved that day because he had by his side Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah. Let us be like Daniel today. No compromise. Where every day is a thanksgiving to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah. If that's your desire, please stand with me today as we sing our closing song. It's number 618 in your hymnal. 618. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, you are the Lion of Judah. You give us the courage and the strength to bring your word to the people, to make it through this life, to that life that's everlasting that you promise us. We thank you for the peace that you give us. Let us never forget that that peace did not come cheap. Please be with us today as we leave here. Keep us safe until we meet again to worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.